Bom, bom dia a todos e a todas. Nós vamos dar início a essa atividade organizada pelo professor Massato Ninomia. É, temos aqui a felicidade e a honra de receber é, o professor Yoshida. Yoshida Sensei, a São Paulo da Igacon e Irachama Sei. E... Eu vou, é, como chefe de departamento e, e professor da disciplina que acolhe essa atividade, eu vou passar a palavra ao professor Massato para apresentar o professor Yoshida e conduzir os trabalhos. Então, professor Massato, muito obrigado pela iniciativa, sempre é, muito atenta às questões de internacionalização da nossa faculdade. E tudo isso aí, né? Ano... Gustavo Monaco Sensei ga ano ma sampo da ke no ma hangei no ki o hiyoshimashite ma kara ima gakkachō desu kara gakkachō toshite soshite mata kyō wa ano kare no jigyō o ma ano ano karite yarashite itadaite rai desu ne hai sore de ma watashi ga mo chotto mata ima yoshida sensei no shoukai shimasu nda ne mo professor yoshida é mais novo que eu né mas estudamos juntos na Faculdade de Direito da Universidade de Tóquio. Ele, tivemos o mesmo orientador, professor Rochino, é, professor titular de Direito Civil né, da Universidade de Tóquio. E depois de doutorado, né, ele então foi nomeado para ser professor na Universidade de Hokkaido, né, que é aquela ilha ao norte do Japão, né? E o professor Yoshida, ele é professor de Direito Civil, mas é muito interessado em assuntos de meio ambiente, é, da situação dos, dos silvícolas, né, dos índios, né, não só do Brasil, mas de todo mundo. E, dessa vez, então, ele veio é, fazer uma pesquisa né, sobre a poluição né, no, na Amazônia e as consequências disso é, com os índios né, daquela região. E eu tive a felicidade de apresentar para ele, um amigo meu, que tem uma ONG que atua lá no estado da Amapá. Né? Então, ele esteve lá por três dias, no interior da Amapá. Eu, desculpa, eu nem conheço a Amapá direito, né? mas ele foi lá para o interior vamos ver a situação da poluição né? e conseguiu chegar em tempo ontem à noite para dar essa palestra para nós. Hoje e segunda-feira, e segunda-feira à noite ele já vai embora, né? Então, o, enfim, é uma pessoa muito interessada né, nos assuntos do Brasil, muito preocupado com a situação da, da degradação do meio ambiente, muito preocupado com a situação dos nossos índios. Né? E, mas hoje ele vai falar sobre um outro assunto, que é exatamente a reparação né, das vítimas da bomba atômica né, e também essa questão dos de direitos humanos, né? que justamente é, 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 são as minhas aulas de pós-graduação no segundo semestre, que é o direito internacional da pessoa humana. Né? Então, venho falando aí sobre as vítimas da bomba, venho falando sobre as mulheres de conforto, é, trabalho escravo na, durante a guerra, né? essas coisas que ele vai abordar rapidamente né? na manhã de hoje. Então, e não sou eu que sem ser já あの、ブラジルのいろんな案件について関心があって、今まあ、あの、今回もアマパニカレてですね、ま、先住民のこととか、あるいはその、え、環境汚染のことにですね、いろいろとまあ、あの、関心を持たれてま、視察してこられて、
and uh, um, I've been very honored to come here uh, for uh, lecture early this morning and uh, thank you for coming uh, all of you and uh, um, I've just been told that uh, this uh, uh, university uh, of course a very historic uh, prominent university and uh, uh, for example, in the night already in the 1930s, uh, uh, Professor Tanaka, uh, the Kotaro Tanaka, an, an expert uh, of commercial law and jurisprudence, visited this university to, to give a lecture. And I very much uh, admire him. And uh, of course, Professor Masato or Ninomiya is my great superior. Both of us uh, studied at uh, Tokyo University under the same mentor, uh, Professor Eiichi Hoshino. Uh, and uh, um, he has uh, lots of net networks and uh, uh, this time um, he introduced me to uh, uh, a person named uh, Mr. Uh, Desio uh, Yokota uh, working uh, for the vulnerable people damaged by the mercury in uh, living along the Amazon. Continue, okay. 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 And so, and th just this morning, the, uh, we have a completely different audience uh, next week and i've been asked to give on um, some other topic and so i'm i'm right now the uh writing an articles about amazon the mercury a uh, problems there and this is uh, do you know what it, what this is this is a scale of a pilar of poo <laughs> and uh, oh sorry and um you know i i've been there i I took a boat ride there uh, for uh, one hour and a half, one way, and uh, but uh, there's no bird, uh, no, uh, you cannot see any fish, and uh, all the river there uh, contaminated, contaminated, and uh, there's a gold mine uh, named Villanova. Uh, uh, and some uh, artisanal, the small scale uh, gold miners uh, are working, still working. But I'm actually very interested in what's going there. But in case I do, I might be shot. <laughs> so so that this is the situation. So I, this time I, I was close. Uh, uh, from there, uh, but I could not see the site. And all the uh, NPO, N NGO staff, uh, the Mr. Yokota is affiliated, uh, could not see the site. So that's the situation. And on the other hand, in Japan, uh, we have uh, lots of Minamata disease related people, including special doctors, who are willing to come, who are willing to come for medical help for those people. And we have the long tradition of friendship between Brazil and Japan. And so my visit uh, until yesterday was just the beginning of our long-term uh, relationship. Uh, with regard to Minamata disease here in this country. And uh, so um, let's hope for the best. And uh, I'm going to talk about the reparations. So can you give us a slide? Is that, can you see? Oh, okay. 
So reparations, the topic is reparations, uh, starting from the Japanese procuring atomic bombs victims from cases. Okay, next one. Next one, please. Uh, as many of you know, the uh, some years ago in uh, 2016, I met with Mr. Morita, Takashi Morita, who is the leader of the plaintiffs for uh, atomic bombing uh, victims in Brazil litigation. And uh, uh, I also uh, met uh, with his daughter uh, last December. Yeah, go ahead. I have so many, so many slides, more than 200 slides. And this is uh, his uh, previous store named Sukiyaki. Many of you might have been there. Go ahead. And at that time, he was uh, 91, right now 97. And uh, 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 this is uh, last uh, December. Uh, they moved to uh, their new store. And uh, I had some lunch with uh, his daughter. OK. And here's uh, Mr. Morita's timeline, OK? Uh, he was hit by August 6, 1945, uh, when he, he lived in Hiroshima. And he, uh, he was injured in uh, his neck and hospitalized uh, on the same month. And, and it's that's heavy, severe typhoon hit uh, the hospital uh, shortly after uh, uh, he was uh, uh, freed uh, from that hospital. And he had uh, luck. Uh, in the following year, he He started to run a clock store, and then he got married with uh, his wife. And the daughter, uh, Yasuko Saito, was born uh, in the following year. And in February 1956, they decided to immigrate into Brazil and they left Kobe uh, for Santos. But the uh, life here was harder than they had expected. And uh, in 1984, he organized the atomic bomb victims in Brazil association with uh, his friends when the Japanese welfare ministry rejected the pro protection for them. The, the Japanese Brazilian uh, suffering from atomic bomb in those days, uh, but uh, they could get nothing. Uh, and they decided to file, make a lawsuit. And there are actually, there are a lot of uh, related cases uh, by uh, resident Korean. In those days in uh, Hiroshima prefecture, the one-tenth of the whole population in Hiroshima was from Korean Peninsula. And so uh, many Koreans were hit by atomic bombing in those days. And, but after they're coming back to their own country, uh, they 
could not get any help, any protection uh, for them. And so this is a big issues uh, for the atomic bombs, bomb victims uh, all over the world. And here in Brazil, Mr. Uh, uh, Morita uh, spearheaded the litigation from the victims in this country. This is the case. And uh, uh, his Korean uh, victim uh, friends uh, won his case in 2001. And in the following year, he filed a lawsuit. Uh, although he was hit by heart failure in the same year. And in 2007, he finally won the lawsuit at the Japanese Supreme Court. So coincidentally, I was asked by the uh, Yushikaku Publishing Company to write a comment on this case. This is a great coincidence. And uh, I uh, wrote down a very long articles on this case. And, uh, and since then, I got friends with the uh, related attorney, uh, and uh, I decided to come here to meet with uh, those uh, Japanese Bra Brazilian victims. In 2009, his wife uh, died. Okay, next slide, please. And this is the, the attorney Adachi on your right hand side, the, the related uh, attorney. And on your left hand side, Professor Tamura, uh, who used to be a professor of Hiroshima University and the specialist of these issues. Okay, next. Okay, and uh, let's uh, uh, consider the mainstream of the a atomic bombing victims in, in Korea. Okay, uh, next one. The, not many people know that one tenth, as I said, one tenth of the atomic bomb victims in Japan were Korean. The number of Korean victims was 23,000, but only a tenth of them were alive. So 90% of them already passed on. And now, so much less. Uh, and uh, many of the Korean victims uh, stayed in the sanatorium in Hapcheon, the, uh, the city called Hiroshima in Korea. The, and a lot of people there, uh, including those in Tegu, uh, moved to Hiroshima in those days. Okay, next one. And there's a, also a memorial uh, for more than a thousand at that sanatorium uh, who died miserably without any protection. And because uh, that's contrasted to the Japanese victims yeah. uh, who can get uh, officially protection from the Japanese welfare, uh, well, Japanese Ministry of Welfare. I visited there in 2008 to pay tributes to them and had a chance to give a lecture there. And this is the Hapcheon Memorial Hall. Right now, uh, more than a thousand victims uh, 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 there. And, uh, and see here, next one, the sanatorium, next one. And uh, uh, this is uh, one of those victims who's uh, staying in that sanatorium. Okay. Right. However, sadly enough, the Korean victims could not get the special medical treatment for 
the atomic bomb patients in Japan. Once they left Japan, because the administrative notice number 402 that supplanted the special statutes regarding the atomic bomb health treatment required the victim's residence in Japan. Even in Korean society, Korean victims faced discrimination and remained hidden and abandoned without getting any special treatment for the ordinary atomic bomb victim. They were really miserable without any help from two countries. For more than uh, 30 years, following the atomic bombing in 1945, the same thing could be mentioned about the Japanese Brazilian victims. So uh, let's uh, think about the related rules, the statutes for the special care for the atomic bomb victims. And as I said, by this uh, administrative notice number 402, they were excluded uh, from the protection. Go ahead. The statutes uh, regarding medical treatment for the atomic bomb victims originally focused the Japanese victims and the related notice uh, number 402 issued in 1974, uh, but which was abolished in 2003 uh, after the series of uh, uh, litigations uh, from the uh, Korean victims. And that stipulates the eligibility for the special free care for the atomic victims requires the residence in Japan. Therefore, the Korean victims who left Japan lost the opportunity to get the special health care for the atomic related diseases. And as I said, the same thing can be said uh, about Mr. Morita, uh, uh, his uh, daughter, uh, Miss. Saito and other Japanese Brazilian uh, victims. The government officials argued that the medical treatment for the atomic bomb patients was a matter of social welfare of each country as a rationale for the limitation of eligibility. They stressed that the Korean government should provide the Korean victims with the medical care as their social welfare policy in Korea. I think it is true that theoretically, it is the US who should be primarily responsible for the atomic bomb casualties, even though at the international law level, the reparations right against US has been wavered by the San Francisco Treaty of the 1951. However, on the other hand, it is not easy to say that Japanese government is not liable at all for the Korean victims, including uh, Brazilian victims, because some Korean victims were deported as a slave labor at the Mitsubishi Steel Corporation uh, located at the Bay Area in Hiroshima. And therefore, have been injured and killed by the atomic bomb. In such cases, Japanese government and Japanese corporation could be secondarily responsible. Even in no slave labor cases, the United States might argue that Japan should take primary responsibility for all those consequences because Japan broke the war. Okay. Uh, but after that, when you study the, the litigation by them, by victims, by atomic bomb victims, we experienced a kind of remarkable, exceptional, uh, critical movement. Um, so it's remarkable that the Japanese judicial branch has been taking a progressive approach in this field in recent years and has expanded 
to the protection to cover the Korean and Brazilian bombing victims in spite of the legislative, original legislative and administrative negative uh, stance. Go ahead. It's already started in the mid 1970s that the Japanese Supreme Court decision of 1978 has developed the, this uh, critical interpretation that is different from the original position for, of the drafters of the related statute by the interpretation of Justice Dando, who is a prominent criminal law scholar, uh, Pro Professor Ninomiya, uh, uh, I think he, he he met with Professor Dando uh, in those days. Uh, Professor Emeritus of Criminal Law, or cr Criminal Procedure Law at the Tokyo University and others. The statute includes, he said, he argued in his, in, in his decision, uh, the related statute includes the moment of war reparations. And the Korean victims should also be protected equally so there's an equality rule in his mind. And the Brazilian victims also equally protected by the statute. And uh, this is one of the, the famous uh, uh, plaintiffs, the Korean uh, victims who uh, filed a lawsuit and he won the case, okay? And this is a picture of Professor Dando. Uh, okay. It ordered in that case in issuance of at atomic bomb victims notebook and admitted the medical allowances, even if the Korean victim came to Japan illegally. That's uh, his case, the Son Shindo, uh, Mr. Son Shindo case, and, uh, and stayed in Japan temporarily. This is really a uh, revolutionary interpretation. Regarding the number uh, 402 administrative notice that I already mentioned, uh, issued in 1974, uh, it ordered to stop and reject the medical allowance for the Korean or some other foreign victims who left Japan to go back to their own country. So a series of notable decisions have been issued uh, recently. First, the Osaka High Court decision in 2001, that's the uh, Kakkihun case, the, it's the, the previous year uh, the, when the, the Mr. Morita decided to uh, file a lawsuit uh, from the Japanese Brazilian victims. So that case canceled the administrative act that stopped the medical allowance for the Korean victim following the 402 uh, notice, but judging that the 402 administrative notice was illegal. And remind that the 402 notice notification was abolished in 2003 after this decision. Second, in the lawsuits demanding the past medical allowances that had been stopped by 402 notice, the Supreme Court decision of 2007 and 2008 deny the application of the statute of limitation and order the retroactive payment of the medical allowances which was denied were denied in the past. Go ahead. So this is uh, uh, another uh, plaintiff. Thirdly, for the damages lawsuit by the Korean victims whose medical allowances were discontinued by the 402 notice, 
and even by those who have lost the chances to, to apply for the medical allowances because of the existence of a 402 notice. And the Supreme Court decisions of 2007, that's the Hiroshima Mitsubishi forced labor cases, admitted the payment of pain and sufferings uh, for the emotional justice, uh, damage, uh, 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 so uh, the uh, the the cases uh, the requests were admitted. Okay, go ahead. And this is nothing but the governmental liability, uh, uh, which can be said governmental reparations. And by the same token, this decision is extremely important, even though it is related to atomic bombing. By this progressive decision, the settlement move, movement seeking to protect the Korean victims in the similar situation is going on. And uh, in the Memorial Park in Hiroshima, uh, you can see this uh, 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 tribute gray uh, for the Korean victims in Hiroshima. Okay. And this is the central gate of the Hiroshima uh, Mitsubishi Steel Co Corporation. And so uh, here's the kind of intermediary ending remark. So exceptionally, in this case, the, there's a revolutionary, a critical case law development compared to other reparation cases. So there's a, uh, theoretically, there's a uh, conflicts of interest. On the one hand, there's a domestic social policy issues and uh, the protection should be uh, awarded only for the domestic people. But on the other hand, there's a equal treatment principles for all atomic bomb victims, survivors. So which can be set uh, can be seen as the reparation uh, for damage due to slave labor or World War II. And as it, it, it can be viewed as a domestic reparations versus international reparations. In Japan, historically, when you see the many related judgment, the domestic reparations uh, have been awarded uh, without any problems. But on the other hand, the international reparations were rare cases. And this case is one of them, one of exceptional international reparation cases. So, and then we, uh, there's an uh, uh, agenda uh, in the future. This is the question. Can 40 atomic bomb survivors get free health care for the damage, even though they are outside Japan by uh, article of a related statute. And then in response to this issue, the Supreme Court, Japanese Supreme Court decision of 2015 uh, said, yes, it canceled the rejection of reimbursement for overseas medical care. With regard to Japanese Brazilian victims, survivors, they can get free healthcare uh, for their damage, for example, at the Santa Cruz Hospital here, without any process of reimbursement since April 2019. So, however, in we are moving to some other Japan related uh, reparation cases. In most Japan related reparation cases, total remedies have been generally denied due to the statute of limitation, uh, state immunity doctrine, lack of evidence, and most commonly the waiver clause of the international treaty uh, between Japan and Korea, 
1965 and uh, the declaration uh, between Japan and China in 1972. For example, slave labor cases, comfort women cases, Nanjing massacres, Pindinsha massacre, and some other cases. Unit 731 bio war cases, Chongqing, Lushan, and other situation bombings cases. Uh, in all of them, the reparations were uh, generally denied. So notice that uh, the foreign atomic bomb victims cases are very exceptional cases. And, uh, uh, and so the attain that goal, the, the critical uh, interpretation of the related statute starting uh, from that of uh, Professor Dando uh, is very remarkable in the Japanese uh, uh, judiciary uh, history. So, but there's, a, as I uh, indicated, there are exceptions that uh, domestic reparations such as leprosy patient segregation cases or AIDS infection cases. Internationally, the Korean Supreme Court, on the other hand, the Supreme Korean uh, Supreme Court uh, has admitted reparations in Korean slave labor cases since 2012 decision and uh, 2018 uh, decision. After I gave a lecture there on uh, in this regard, in fall of 2011, which has brought about the deadlock uh, of the relationship between two, two countries, Japan, Japan and Korea. Go ahead. And uh, so there are so many slides. Can I continue? Do they, they have any questions? Uh, let's, uh, yeah. Um, I'm going to, to give you the kind of outline. The, as for slave labor uh, in Japan, there are so many uh, Korean slave laborers. Uh, at the end of World War II, there are about uh, 150,000 Korean slave laborers uh, in Hokkaido only. And as for Chinese slave labor, there are about uh, 40,000 uh, Chinese slave labor. Their, their situation were, was much more miserable than Korean uh, slave laborers. And a half of them uh, worked in Hokkaido. About the 58, Chinese slave labor uh, sites out of 135 sites were uh, located uh, in Hokkaido. There's so many coal mines in Hokkaido uh, in those days and all of them have been abolished nowadays. And so in the previous slide you previous slide. No, 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 previous slide. Yeah, so you uh, you might have the uh, beautiful image about Hokkaido, you know, Akan Lake, Hot Spring, uh, the Shiretoko area, even though in, in spite of the recent tragedy, both boat ride tragedy there, and uh, uh, ski road resort area, uh, omnipresent uh, in Hokkaido. But uh, there's a dark side in those days. Okay, go ahead. Uh, okay, go ahead. As I said, the 150, go ahead. And as I said, yeah, thanks, go ahead. So, uh, there are a series of related official governmental decisions in those days uh, for the 
slave labor, recruiting slave laborers. Oh, let's skip the, you, you know, the, my, my slides are uh, in that laptop. So you are free to, to take a look at after the details afterwards. Go ahead. And uh, I'm happy to show you some, some of the related pictures. Yeah, so some of them, some of the Chinese slave laborers includes very, very prominent people, as you may gather. For, for example, this is Professor uh, uh, Fan Yipin, who ended up uh, become a medical professor in Guangzhou University. Uh, go ahead. And this is him. He already passed on, but at the age of 80, he, he was active in those days when, when I visited his hospital. But at the age of 15, he was arrested all of a sudden in Shanghai and uh, uh, deported forcibly to Hokkaido. And he he did not, at that time, he, he did not know to where, where he was uh, forcibly moved and he had to work uh, at the coal mine near Yubari, that, that's a famous uh, tourist spot. And, and many lawsuits were filed uh, about these issues. But, most of their legal efforts have been unsuccessful. Go ahead. Yeah, but notice that there's a leading case was issued in 2007 that uh, uh, Chinese post label cases in Hiroshima. I went to the site and uh, this, this famous decision re rejected legal reparations but um notice that the japanese supreme court decision in 2007 on the other hand have stressed the importance of moral repar rep reparations moral responsibility of the the nishimatsu uh, construction co corporation and they they even argue the company to pay reparations voluntarily. Okay, go ahead. And after this 2007 Supreme Court decision, um, the big reparations settlements uh, have been made successively, consecutively in 2007 and the years thereafter. I think the Nishimatsu settlements have fared well with regard to reconciliation, with compared to Hanaoka settlement with Kashima Corporation in 2007, because they include, go ahead. First, the admittance of the past tragic events, as well as their responsibility. This is very important. I'll show you the, the process of reconciliation afterwards as a theoretical framework. And second, their sincere apology. Third, the supplementary monetary compensation, even though the monetary awards for each victim are not enough, big enough um, compared to the 2 million uh, yen reparations per person in the Japanese American internment camp cases. So this is the, the two memorial as the, the Hiroshima uh, Nishimatsu Corporation slave labor site. Go ahead. And this is another settlement uh, of uh, Mitsubishi Material uh, Corporation. And uh, it uh, covering uh, much more slave labels, Chinese slave labels. Go ahead. On the other hand, the Hanaoka uh, settlement in 2000 uh, has caused a crucial problem, crucial uh, criticism from the part of the victim groups, including the group leader 
Genshin. He's famous. He was, I actually uh, visited his house uh, close to Beijing in the uh, Hanan uh, uh, state uh, province because he was shocked because he Kashima Corporation argued after that settlement, uh, it would deny reparations in spite of the provision of uh, 500,000, uh, so, sorry, 500 million yen plus one. And this settlement lacked sincerity of the apology in this sense. So this, the bottom picture was taken at his house, the plaintiff leader's house in China. And uh, he's uh, Gensen at the age of 95, but a uh, couple of years afterwards, uh, he passed on. And uh, the middle one, there's a mountain and uh, uh, by his revolt, all the, the Chinese slave laborers uh, ran away uh, to that mountain and until they were arrested by the police in those days. And their situation uh, was very miserable. And the uh, uh, memorial, such <laughs> a strange uh, picture though, and that there's annually there's a memorial uh, for those uh, uh, Chinese, Chinese slave labor in Akita prefecture in the Northern part of Japan. Go ahead. Um, so there's some other issues, uh, repatriation of remains uh, of the, uh, the slave laborers. Okay, go ahead. And uh, yeah, go ahead. And there's a uh, grassroots movement of returning remains of forced labor victims. Uh, that I joined, go ahead. Uh, yeah, the, about a decade ago, there's a uh, investigation of the tragic situation in those days in the northern, uh, northernmost tip of Hokkaido named Asajino, one of the biggest airport bases for the Japanese army in the 1940s, we had more, more than uh, 1,200 Korean people got involved in the harsh slave labor in those days, okay? And according to the testimony by Mr. Chi Okton, who worked there in 1943 at the age of 19, it turned out that their workplace and the miserable cabins were secretly excluded from the outside ordinary space that was like gold mine. He, <laughs> uh, it was excluded, the gold miners, and uh, uh, we cannot uh, realize what happened, what kind of problem, the health problem they, they might have. Uh, the, here in 1940s, the, the same situation happened. So that no local resident could, could, not, could see and know the reality of their slave labor. However, on the other hand, NGO members have encountered critical difficulties in identifying the excavated remains and finding their relatives to repatriate them. Go ahead. And this is Mr. Chi Okton, when uh, we visited their grave, then when we tried to excavate, there's so many bones uh, found um, uh, miserably. Go ahead. So um, here's the recent uh, uh, trend in Korean adjudication is about the comfort women issues or, or some other uh, slave labor case, uh, as I mentioned. Go ahead. And this is a picture taken when I gave a lecture there at the Korean Supreme Court, uh, half a year before 
the kind of revolutionary uh, decision uh, about Korean slave labor case in 2012. Yeah, this is one of uh, uh, my friends, uh, Justice Young, uh, who used to be the professor of uh, Seoul National University. Once he invited me to have a have a dinner, <laughs> and uh, I at that time I I didn't know what happened afterwards. So I uh, drank Korean sake, soju, uh, with a delicious dinner, and uh, uh, and then uh, the Mr. Justice Yam, who the Professor Yam uh, at that time became justice uh, of Supreme Court, uh, Korean Supreme Court, and he asked me to come with him to give a lecture there all of a sudden, and, and this is it. And I was kind of just uh, uh, after drinking some alcohol and uh, kind of tipsy, but uh, at that side, there's so many, about 30 Supreme Court uh, law clerks uh, aligning in front of me and with my translator and they asked uh, me to, to talk a little bit of a central message of uh, my reparations uh, articles uh, that I wrote uh, in early 2000s. So this is the picture and this is <laughs> another pictures and Mr. Yan is at the end and uh, it's a kind of big surprise, but but uh, all of them very surprised to realize that the kind of uh, the Japanese uh, leading civil scholars are very sympathetic to their situations and uh, uh, try to develop a kind of a critical uh, interpretation of the judicial doctrines to protect them, and and they got some energy and <laughs> to and issue the kind of revolutionary uh, judgment in 2012 and 2018. Okay, uh, the, is this some other challenges? Uh, the, for most of the, the Korean victims, the, there's no salary paid for them. And uh, in case of paying um, salary in those days, we, we should, according to the civil law doctrines, we evaluate the values, uh, of course. Okay, go ahead. And, uh, okay, go ahead. So, you know, as I mentioned in the, by the uh, Nishimatsu Corporation Supreme Court decision 2007, the Supreme Court justices in Japan uh, stressed the moral reparations as opposed to legal reparation that was denied. And uh, so we can think about uh, these issues in the same way. I suspect there's any, there's a moral obligation to get back to, get back the salary to the slave laborers with re-evaluation just as a Supreme Court. The justices argues in Ishima's decision, even if they admit the legal claim might be barred by the 1965 treaty. Go ahead. And there are several uh, related cases. And, uh, you know, as for reparations across the world, the, uh, the Holocaust, Reparation might be the starting point after the, uh, the end of World War II. In, the, in South, South Africa, in the mid 1990s, the, the apartheid, apartheid reparations may be another big uh, starting point. And in the United States, I, um, I, I did not self introduce myself, but uh, I've been in the uh, United States uh, for a long-term stay, research stay there. And uh, I'm kind of a jack of all trades. I studied a lot and uh, uh, 
Uh, I first uh, started my career by working on tort, business tort, and then moved to contract areas. You might be uh, uh, tired, and so please get relaxed uh, by my um, by my talk. And uh, and then in the 1990s, uh, when I was at uh, uh, Stanford Law School, I my concern has moved to property issues uh, that is uh, related so many so many things and uh, housings urban issues environmental issues or intellectual pro property as well um, so many uh, fields have been developed critically uh, in the united states that's a uh, very shocking that my stanford experience is a kind of shocking experience in my legal career and my concern has moved to property area and uh, I uh, organized the association of kind of uh, housing welfare and uh, dealing with homelessness issues or the, the elderly uh, issues in the regional areas uh, or what else, the, the disaster uh, recovery might be the uh, very important issues uh, uh, because uh, Japan uh, has been overwhelmed by the earthquake every year and uh, almost everywhere. The, and due to the, the climate change, the, in recent years, the, the, the flood issues uh, has been dramatically increasing. Yeah, even in, in Japan. So even in Brazil, in here in Sao Paulo, I've heard from Professor Nino Mia, you also had the flood uh, uh, recently, right? And uh, I also, uh, then in recent years, I, I worked on environmental issues. And uh, so Professor Nino Mia, how, how long should I talk? How, how long should I talk uh, right now? More, okay. Okay, so I just uh, will show you some related pictures, okay? <laughs> to, uh, but I, I think I make myself uh, understood about the, the central message. But uh, let's uh, continue. It's about the comfort women issues. The, so the allegedly as many as 200,000 women have been deported as comfort women. The debate started belatedly, that is from the 1990s by Professor Emeritus Yun Jong-ok of IFA, IFA Women's University. And she organized the Korean Comfort Council. Uh, go ahead. And this is uh, Professor Yoon. Um, after her retirement uh, from the IFA uh, Women University, he st started to work on these issues because when she was a high school student uh, in the previous uh, uh, school of IFA University, many of her friends were gone. So she herself uh, thought, what happened to to my, my friends, many of my friends, that how come they disappear? And uh, working on this, started to work on these issues. Okay, go ahead. And, uh, uh, but many of you uh, already uh, know these issues and uh, uh, the Korean uh, comfort women. Uh, in Korean society, they've been stigmatized, discriminated, and uh, so once they had spoken openly about the miserable past in the Korean society, uh, the comfort women issues were not, the, they discriminated and the stigmatized and the comfort women issues, but not the subject matter in the process of making uh, the Japan-Korea Treaty in 1965. Okay. Hmm. Okay, go ahead. 
and there's a related uh, lawsuit. And Kim Huxon was the uh, was one of those uh, victims and survivors in those days, and he stood out and uh, forward uh, the uh, about and talked, started to talk about her miserable past. And uh, the victim uh, pursued in the lawsuit, the ad admission of the past infamous events. Second, the official legal responsibility of the Japanese government, which organized such semi-official prostitution and third, their official apology. Okay, go ahead. And this is the picture of Kim Huxon. Go ahead. However, almost all the lawsuits have turned out to be unsuccessful, except for the Yamaguchi uh, District Court decision in 1998 that admitted the three, 300,000 yen damages for failing to pass the uh, legislative reparations for comfort women for a long time after the end of World War II. And uh, uh, for example, the Japanese Supreme Court decision in 2003, he rejected the legal remedies by mentioning the state immunity. Do you remember that? There are a lot of hurdles uh, when we attain the goal, but, uh, but in that judgment, uh, the they reject remedies by the state immunity doctrine, limitation of action, even though they admitted the existence of tortious uh, acts as a factual evidence. Go ahead. And there's a, uh, on the other hand, after the expression of the prime minister Murayama's personal apology, in the mid 1990s, the Asian Women's Fund was established by collecting monies from the ordinary Japanese citizens who felt guilt about the comfort of women issues. But it was not the governmental organization and it was based on the denial of the legal responsibility of the Japanese government. Although it included a letter of the prime minister's personal apology. So the Asian Women's Fund has been rejected by many comfort, Korean comfort women, especially by almost uh, um, that organization. The so you can understand why they are not satisfied with the provision of money itself. It's, uh, this situation is similar to that of the um, Hanaoka settlement. The, Mr. Gensen, the plaintiff leader, was shocked uh, shortly after the provision of uh, 500,000 yen, uh, 500 million the yen, the, because of the lack of sincere apology and because of lack of admission of uh, uh, the true fact, historical miserable past. The same thing can be said about these issues. And uh, the Wednesday protest rally started in early 1990s when Pro uh, Prime Minister Mia Miyazawa uh, visited Korea. Okay, go ahead. And this is the, in those days, the Wednesday protest rally in those days, but uh, right now the, the, most of the, the related comfort to women uh, are gone actually. And uh, the, the bronze statue was built uh, just in front of the uh, Japanese embassy in Seoul uh, when the 1,000 memorial 
process rally was held in uh, when was that in December 2011 I was there uh, at that time okay go ahead and there's a uh, uh, an agreement comfort agreement in, at the end of 2015 this is a kind of crucial issues and uh, uh, people look forward to what happened uh, uh, following this agreement uh, by the uh, Prime Minister Kishida. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. I, I just show you the picture, some relation. Okay, this is, and here's uh, the Nanchi massacre issues. Uh, but I'm just wondering, you, you were interested in those. But uh, the Japan has a lot, a lot of uh, uh, historical injustice in the past and the Japanese invasion into mainland Japan. China in the 1930s and 40s caused a lot of tragedies and casualties. Among them, the Nanchi massacre from December 1937 uh, to February of the following year has been one of the most debatable and most notorious tragedies in for its cruelty and its size of casualties. And it's uh, contrasted to the recent uh, Bucha genocide uh, in Ukraine. So if you go to Nanchi Massacre Memorial Museum, you'll notice poll notifying the number of killed people uh, 300,000 people. Even though not a few Japanese historians argue the victim's number is less than 30, 300,000. For example, the mainstream Japanese historians argue it was about uh, 200,000. The conservative historians advocate the several ten of thousands. But still, such numbers is very big. Go ahead. And there's a, the John Rabe's house. Uh, Mr. Rabe is trying to help those uh, Chinese victims and survivors in their house. Go ahead. And this is the gate of the Nanshi Massacre Museum. Go ahead. And this, this is a sculptures of the uh, miserable situation in those days. And uh, a lot of uh, uh, the citizens, the uh, assembled on the river bank of Yangtze River and bundled up and killed. That's uh, what historians uh, told us. Go ahead. And uh, when you notice a lot of uh, related pictures of Bucha uh, tragedies in Ukraine not now being held, uh, the histories uh, repeat itself. And uh, uh, we have to think about what's the, what's the peace uh, philosophy development after the, the end of uh, World War II, after the big tragedies uh, in Japan and in Europe, so across the world. And uh, uh, I just wonder what, nothing has changed. Uh, much, sad to say. But um, in this the series of uh, uh, research, as I show you, the, uh, I'm trying to conceive the theoretical framework. That's the process of attaining the, the historical reconciliation. Consists of four steps. Four steps. The first, the the admission of historical uh, tragic past, 
And second, based on that uh, recognition, the, the admission of historical responsibility from the perpetrator's side, and based on two of those steps, the perpetrator should make a poor apology and uh, should offer supplementary monetary compensation. Third, and, and fourth, the last step, the, from the victim's side, uh, there might be forgiveness. And that's, this is uh, the uh, genuine process, genuine process of, of re reconciliation. And in spite of the limitedness of the, this uh, reconciliation effort, uh, compared to a lot of uh, vicious circles, vicious circles of hatreds uh, across the world, we, we need to, to continue this limited effort. That's my message, but uh, it's uh, uh, shown in the last part of these uh, 200 slides. And, but uh, that's the essence, but let's go continue then uh, the massacre forgotten by so uh, just to remember four steps the first one the starting point is the, the recognition of historical past tragic past that's the, the uh, historic uh, education uh, but you might know what happened uh, what is happening in the Japanese uh, historic uh, education for youngsters. The Japanese young people, many of them, do know nothing about the Nanchi massacres. So that's the strategically conservative uh, politicians are doing. They try to reduce, reduce the situation education of the historical past. You know, I, I think uh, most of the youngsters, including many university students of, of my university, Hokkaido University, all of them have conscience, conscience. But many of them don't have the chance to learn the details of historical past. You know, in case of Japanese Brazilian cases, uh, atomic bomb cases, all of us from the Japanese side, they know the tragic truths uh, of the, uh, the damage, how cruel the atomic bombing uh, damage was. And they, so they can imagine what happened to Korean victims, what happened to Brazilian victims. So they are Japanese, uh, many of them are very sympathetic to that uh, revolutionary interpretation. But in, in contrast to those uh, exceptional cases, uh, many uh, uh, reparation cases covering the forced labor cases or comfort women cases, the, the massacres, the bombing. You know, I, I know de in details what happened to Chongqing bombings. And actually I, I, I wrote an article uh, about the situation I met with in, in Chongqing. I met with, um, more than 50 uh, victims and survivors, and some of them still, the bullet uh, are in the bodies. And uh, the, some of them are defaced by the bombing. And their, um, their cruel, you know, uh, emotional, the mental, uh, damage still continuing after several decades. But from the Japanese side, perpetrator side, 
they, they don't have, many of them don't know anything about the Chongqing bombing. Chongqing bombing continues for several years, several years. And it uh, destroyed a lot of uh, urban uh, infrastructures, houses, and uh, killed so many people. So after learning all of them, uh, we can easily understand what happened to Ukraine. And, but, but according to the Japanese uh, uh, broadcast, they just mentioned uh, we can understand by the uh, atomic bombings. And uh, uh, they would not mention the China invasion in China and how harsh the bombings in, in Chongqing, Lushan, and some other so Sompang and, and some other areas uh, uh, was. Uh, so this is the situation. And uh, uh, my, my talk might be endless <laughs> yeah, because I've been working on these issues for more than two decades. And, uh, but I, um, I'm kind of a, a theory person uh, in my earlier stages. But when, we, when I established the Housing Welfare Association, with Professor Late, Professor Hayakawa, uh, the, who's a professor emeritus of Kobe University. Uh, he warned me the, and by saying that your study should be down to earth. You, you should increase uh, more the empirical investigation. You should uh, meet with uh, a lot of uh, uh, real people. Uh, and so I, yeah, kind of changed uh, my uh, way of uh, research method uh, multifacetedly, adding the empirical uh, research. And this is uh, Today's, uh, this morning's uh, lecture is uh, one of them. And uh, I also, the, the baseline is reparations and reconciliation process. And, uh, and the same thing can be said about indigenous people uh, in Japan. I'm the specialist. I, I, I wrote, a, I'm a civil scholar so working on that topic. I, I need issues. Uh, um, but right now, the, I'm working on indigenous issues compared to uh, so many, so many uh, indigenous people across the world. So in case of this country, Brazil, they, their situation is so miserable, and many of you don't know, and I look forward to learning a lot about them from all of you. Okay, this is it. Sorry, this is the kind of. Uh, actually, I prepared two hundred slides for two lectures, and but uh, um, so so if you have time to uh, some time to uh, spare, uh, you're welcome to attend uh, my second uh, lecture. But uh, but this is a kind of a intermediate end of my talk. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I'm happy to accept your questions. Okay. Yeah, please. Uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you very much. Um, the, uh, Yoshida Sensei, I thank you very much for your uh, extraordinary lecture about this uh, important facts and that uh, for us it's always a way to learn. I would also like to thank for all these respectful audience here. I have been a student 
here in this uh, law school, as you, most of you youngers that are here, I'm honored to be here uh, after uh, so long time, but and to congratulate upon you for this opportunity to hear uh, uh, Dr. Yoshida uh, lecture that was explained. I learned a lot and I continue to learn, although I consider myself an eternal student like, like you. And I would like to ask uh, Yoshida Sensei a question. Uh, according to your experience and your uh, wise considerations about the uh, history and the massacres, massacres that have been uh, occurred, that occurred in the past, I myself consider all wars, second, first, third, maybe this fourth, they say that it's a fourth war, maybe it's the third because we have the Cold War that we have been facing, but according to your experience, your learnings, uh, your wise considerations, what parallel could you bring us or do you consider to us as a learning for us, this present, this current conflict or war that is occurring presently between Ukraine and Russia. I know that it's, it's different from the, the focus that you have brought to us, but what parallel and what advice to us you could consider for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, it's very tough questions, and uh, you, you know the 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 vicious circle is uh, kind of endless and uh, ubiquitous. Yeah, and but uh, to stop the vicious circle and to get it back to the normalized uh, uh, friend uh, friendly relationship. Uh, we have to do something, you know, and, uh, uh, but so in the, from the 1990s, uh, 2000s, such reconciliation, international reconciliation efforts is going on across the world, I, I think. Um, but in recent years, the kind of, uh, there are so many dictators uh, outstanding uh, across the world, and uh, that's uh, a <laughs> my my talk is uh, a series of uncom unfinished business. Unfinished business is a term we often use for those issues, and uh, hmm, the the situation. Is almost same or worse, of course, worse than uh, that in 1990s, the 2000s, and uh, so this is <laughs> this is a question. The professor's question is the the question uh, I'd like you to answer. You, you, uh, I would like you all to answer and to, to give me some advice. And uh, so let's uh, see a slide and uh, you know, so for example, uh, at the beginning of my, my talk, we, I mentioned that uh, uh, I have many uh, friends, Minamata disease friends, who internationally would like to help the, the Brazilian vulnerable people uh, who are still um, suffering from the same disease likewise. And uh, they themselves know the situation and they want to share their knowledge to alleviate their suffering. This is kind of a 
reconciliation efforts, the collaboration effort. Even though in, it's limited, we, we have to increase those chances in many ways. And luckily, historically, uh, we have the long-term friend relationship between two countries. And I think the Professor Nino, uh, Nino Mia's efforts to make a bridge between two countries is enormous, enormous, definitely. And, uh, but all of us, you know, following his effort, we have to do something, small things might be better than nothing from the grassroots level. So for example, so just the, the Dr. Takao, Shigeru Takaoka, uh, who is practicing medicine for Minamata disease patients for so many years, asked me to, to go to the sites, miserable sites, to, to see what happens. And you should introduce the situation to Japan. And there are a lot of uh, uh, people uh, who are sympathetic to that situation, who would like to revisit Brazil to improve the situation. This is a, a good example. So that's uh, what I'm going to do uh, next. And I'm right now at the hotel from, uh, actually I didn't sleep last night. <laughs> I, I, I was busy working um, the, my, my tiny articles, but uh, uh, because it's, uh, it's important and it's a uh, continue, it's related to the global environmental justice, you know, the uh, indigenous people are very humble with regard to natural environment. I attended the, the international conference in Turin, Torino in Italy. And uh, do you know what? The, the Turin, Turin was the center of Egyptian studies. There, there is a very uh, good Egyptian museums. And if you go there, there's a, the great exhibits of the uh, Book of the Dead, the book about the Egyptian kings who made pyramids. In spite of the enormous power, they, um, believe in animism, that's contrasted remarkably to the, to the anthropocentric, anthropocentric world after the Jesus Christ. You know, the, it's the, the vision is very different than the modern, modern vision, modern civilized vision. And uh, it's, uh, it's related to the indigenous vision of the Aino people, indigenous people in Japan, many of them, um, they believe natural gods uh, all over and they are humble. And so in the era of the environmental crisis in the 21st century, we need such a humble indigenous way uh, of viewing world environment. So, so you know the, the details, what's uh, going on in the, in the Amazon. It's a, it's a world of the agenda. The, I like Brazil, thanks to him. And uh, we need to kind of collaboratively uh, think about the, the, the world issue to protect the, 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 the superb natural environment, including, inclu including indigenous peoples living there. I'm sorry. Professor Yoshida, yes, uh, some other people want to make a question, please. Please. Thank you, Professor. 
Um, uh, at first, I have to apologize about my poor English. <laughs> I don't know if I will commit some grammar mistakes, probably. Uh, I'm not a law student. I'm student of philosophy department. Uh, and I saw about your lecture today because a friend of mine here from law school uh, sent me. Yeah. And uh, something uh, I note and I about Hokkaido University. And at first, the first thing that I remember, it was about I knew people because uh, my grandmother was an I knew woman and she was expelled by Japanese empire for Brazil. And um, how, how can I continue? Just, just uh, let me try think because your lecture, it was about a lot of things, about uh, a lot of examples of repairs, yeah. Um, and um, you mentioned Minamata disease, you know, and Minamata disease, it's, it was um, the responsible of not only Japanese government, but Japanese business, Chiso, yeah, if I remember well. Yeah, and Chiso, it's like uh, Vale do Rio Doce in Brazil, uh, the infection of mercury, yeah. And um, at the same time, a lot of things came to my mind when I think about indigenous people in Brazil, because I descend from indigenous people from Japan. And um, uh, I think that it's not um, just, um, how can I say that? Uh, coincidence, you know, it's not just a simple coincidence that a lot of people was expelled from Japan as indigenous people expelled from, from uh, uh, these territories that was um, in the process of unifying Japan. Yeah, my, my grandmother was expelled in Showa era Oh, uh, well, I, I, I don't know if I have a, a, a good question for you, but um, Ogata-san, Ogata-san, it was a leader in uh, Minamata movement, if I remember well, his name. I read about him in uh, Shoko Yoneyama book about um, post Fukushima, issues in Japan. So she rescued some uh, histories about uh, Minamata disease. And one of things of um, Ogata said, it's about uh, the repair of victims of Minamata. I see uh, many similarities with the, the in, uh, intoxication with mercury in our bay here in Brazil, Shingo River, uh, Amazon River, and you know, um, so uh, to finish, <laughs> Ogata said something like um, uh, the repair, the movement to repair and how, uh, how to repair spiritually also. It's not, Ogata said something like, it's not just about money. It's just about uh, spiritual repair also. So sometimes if I can say something uh, personally, uh, this great expelled from Hokkaido of Ainu people in diaspora for Brazil, in diaspora from South America and Hawaii and California, <laughs> a lot of countries, yeah. Uh, what your opinion may be about uh, this, this possibilities to repair uh, indigenous expelled 
from these regions in Japan. And I'm not saying just about Hokkaido, but about Okinawa also. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, a lot of insightful comments on my lecture. But um, the, I'm going to talk about indigenous people that my second lecture in the, for, 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 for example, the, um, I show you the, the beautiful picture of my campus, but the, how many people, how many students in Hokkaido University know our university was established after expelling Ainu people uh, who used to live there. Our campus used to be the Ainu village, Ainu village. The, but they're, they're ousted um, from, by the government officials in those days, uh, more than 100 years ago. And their ancestor remains were uh, taken uh, by, by scholars, you know, the, and the repatriation of their ancestral uh, remains uh, is a, a big, issues, big issues. And for example, in the, when I uh, talked at the University of uh, British Columbia, the, there's a lot of signs uh, for making apology for the, for the misery past. They, they did the same thing. They ousted the, uh, the Canadian, Indian people, and then they established the, the campus, the university. But in, in our campus, there's no sign of mentioning that historical part. That's the issues. I, I told you the whole process of, of attaining historical reconciliation. And the first stage, the recognition of the historical injustice from perpetrator side. And uh, that's important. That's related to the education for youngsters. That's the starting point. But it's missing uh, basically in Japan. That's the uh, systemic issues. And uh, you know, the, you asked me some so many questions, but uh, yeah, the, so, so what I talked uh, uh, by reparation theories showing some of the uh, concrete issues starting from the Japanese Brazilian uh, atomic bombing cases, uh, the, my theoretical uh, framework can be applied to the historical path with regard to indigenous people. In, in Japan. And I think globally, the same thing can be said about the indigenous people uh, in Brazil. And uh, the previous government tried to, to get reconciliation by new constitution in the late uh, 1980s uh, the, um, by uh, admitting the protected indigenous land or the protected indigenous rights. Uh, but, but from the economic power, there's a kind of a contrasting development as many of you know. And uh, so all of us are facing the, the same agenda theoretically. And we, we have to face this issue and we need kind of collaborations, interdisciplinary collaboration might be required internationally, globally. And the uh, environmental crisis is a kind of global cha challenge for all of us. And uh, yeah, so there's a lot uh, to answer for your questions and, uh, um, 
we are running out of time. So <laughs> let's, uh, if you have time to spare uh, next week, uh, you're welcome to attend my lecture, the part two. Okay, Professor. Thank you very much, Thank you. Thank you again for your question. Yes, thank you, Professor Ishida. I want to make some uh, last remarks. Please take a seat. <laughs> well, as a professor of international law and uh, very concerned about the uh, problem of human rights, I have been studying some of uh, your topics you mentioned in, the, in your lecture. Yes, so about the Minamata case, Yes, yes, I, I don't have many knowledge about that. I think it was a huge problem in Japan. Uh, finally, I think uh, still there are some people with Minamata problem in Japan. And unfortunately in Brazil, as you said, our government has been doing nothing about that. About uh, the problem of uh, uh, Japan, Korea, I think, uh, yes, I recognize the existence of uh, comfort to women. Yes, I recognize uh, there is a problem of a slave labor. Yes, uh, I don't think maybe uh, the agreement with Japan and uh, Korea in 1965 could give solution to everything, yes. But uh, I think there is a, a Korean government, they don't want to give a solution to this problem. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, because as you said, the Japanese government have been, has been doing some efforts to give a solution to the comfort women problem but they don't want to accept. They don't want to accept because Korean government, they don't want former comfort women to accept them. Because some Indonesian, some Filipino, some people has accepted and they receive the money and so, so, and uh, accepted the letter of, uh, uh, from uh, prime minister of Japan, so, so. About the slave labor, yes, uh, Korean first uh, Supreme Court uh, gave the final decision that the Japanese uh, enterprises such as Nippon Steel, such as uh, and other companies should pay. And uh, but it is impossible to to uh, Japanese uh, Japanese judicial power to recognize these Korean sentences in Japan. And so there is a, another political discussion about if uh, the Korean government or Korean justice power will arrest uh, Japanese, um, Japanese enterprises in Korea to pay uh, the, this uh, indemnization to uh, slave, uh, slave works. So I think, I think the, uh, these two problems between Japan and Korea, I think it's much of a, a political affair, much, much more from Korean side than from Japanese side. About the massacre of Nanjing, I understand that always the victory side writes the history. Huh? There are huge discussion if there was 300,000 victims in Nanjing. You said Japanese scholars recognize 200,000. I don't know. I, I, have I have read that the Japanese side uh, put in discussion about this number. But the Chinese side, they don't recognize. They said 300,000. Well, I, I know, I knew that there was some efforts from Japanese side to make a, a committee, to nominate a committee of uh, scholars of 
Chinese side and Japanese side to discuss what happened actually. But the Chinese side, they don't accept that. They said 300,000 and stop. I didn't go to the Nanjing Museum, but uh, some Brazilian student and some Brazilian people went there and uh, they told me uh, it's an effort of Chinese government to make a propaganda that uh, actually was 300,000 people uh, massacred between soldiers, civilians, women, child, baby, and so so. Well, there is no way to discuss the matter. Mm -hmm. huh? for, for, the other hand, for, for the other hand, you mentioned about that two Japanese soldiers that made the competition to kill 100 Chinese killing by sword. Well, this is another discussion because somebody, some people say that it was a propaganda. It was a, it was a kind of a, a Japanese newspaper who wanted to, uh, what can I say, to stimulate this kind of uh, propaganda in the, in the uh, period of war. And um, there is some people say that it was not possible to kill 100 person, uh, 100 people with Japanese sword because Japanese sword, you can't, you can't, you can't cut so many uh, corpses. But anyway, what, what, what I want to say is that I recognize, yes, the massacre, I recognize uh, what the Japanese soldiers made during the war. And actually, it was not a war yet. 1937, there was no war in Japan, China. There was no declaration of war. It was a, a internal conflict between Japan and China. But yes, I recognize. But what you didn't mention was that these people was, they were punished later in the trials happened after the war. These two soldiers, two so soldiers, they were executed by Chinese side. There was International Military Tribunal for Far East and uh, which punished the criminal was rank A. And there was many uh, criminal war uh, trials in many places in Asia, including Nanjing, to trial and punish Japanese soldiers who made, who took part in such a massacre. The commanding officer of Japanese army in Nanjing, uh, Iwane Matsui, he was tried in Tokyo and was executed by hanging. The commanding officer of Japanese army, General Tani, he was, ex uh, he was tried in Nanjing and he was executed in Nanjing. And uh, 2,000 Japanese soldiers in many places of Asia, in the Philippines, in the Myanmar, in the many places in Asia, they were considered guilty by the uh, crimes of massacre and other uh, crimes war and uh, some people in Tokyo, they were uh, uh, actually in Tokyo, uh, seven, uh, seven uh, people were executed. From six, from seven, six were military and one civilian, Mr. Koki Hirota. Well, what I want to say is that uh, uh, these massacres, these problems, uh, I recognize it, they happened, but some people 
has paid by prison or by execution after the war. I recognize also that the Japanese government, they delayed the, to take the solution for these problems. And today they are aged that uh, so many years has passed and uh, it is not possible to discuss the matter anymore. I don't, I, I don't agree with this. This is human rights matter. So Japanese government has to, ha, had to do any, something. Yeah. I recognize also that the Japanese uh, books, Japanese uh, schools, they don't teach. They don't teach about what happened during the war. As well as in the United States, they argue that the launching of atomic bomb, it was necessary to finish the war. I don't know if in the Jap American schools they teach actually what happened in Hiroshima. I know that they don't teach about the bombing of uh, uh, United States bombing into Tokyo in the night of uh, March 10th, which killed 10,000 people, which is almost the same of uh, uh, Hiroshima bombing eh? and Nagasaki bombing. So this has happened with the war. Eh? And uh, Japanese people, they don't say anything. Actually, only few people discuss about this. And uh, also in the Japanese school books, there is only a few mention about uh, emigration of Japanese people to abroad. They, I know that there is some movement that try to insert in Japanese school books, for example, about the existence of uh, Japanese immigrants in Brazil. But uh, young people, they know very few about that. So uh, this is my remarks. I recognize, yes, the existence of all things you said. I recognize the Japanese government has made very few. I recognize that uh, Mr. Morita and other people have suffered very much because they understood that uh, the victims, they would be treated by Japanese government if they are in Japan. But uh, some years, I know uh, our hospital Santa Cruz has been uh, has been the, uh, some, for some years, I don't know exactly from when, but they are attending the victims of the bomb. And uh, I think uh, once two years or three years, there is a, a mission of a Japanese physicians, mainly from Hiroshima, to come to Hospital Santa Cruz to attend the victims, including Mr. Morita and other people. Well, this is my remarks. Please, you have something to say, please. Yeah, the, as Professor Neil mentioned, the, the situation varies depending on the perpetrators. Some of them are executed, some of them are free. For example, the, the prime minister, former prime minister Shinsuke Kishi, uh, was the kind of the, um, they played a central role. Uh, he, he played a central role in the 1940s uh, regarding the uh, recruiting uh, slave laborers from neighboring countries. But in his case, uh, he, was, uh, he was freed uh, from Sagamo prison uh, without any execution. And, uh, and he, he became a prime minister in the 1960s. And uh, uh, as you know, the prime minister uh, Abe uh, is related to him. And so uh, regarding the Nazi mask, it's not the problem of numbers. You know, it's uh, the, the discussion about the numbers is unproductive. I think uh, 300,000 versus uh, 
ten thousands, uh, the or two hundred thousands. But I I met with uh, one of the the survivors, uh, the victims. Uh, when she was uh, at the age of seven, she saw all her families were killed by the Japanese soldiers in front of her. And she herself uh, was almost killed by the sword. And she showed me that there's a picture in, in my slides uh, about the uh, uh, shooting and uh, the, she voluntarily uh, showed me a, a, her scar uh, in those days, but uh, but he she she has had series of uh, uh, litigations, defamation, litigation. Even though um, she won the case, her uh, she she was. Uh, uh, mentally damaged severely and seriously. So, so we have to think about in already I pointed out some of the examples of the Genshin case or, or the comfort women case. The in the reparation cases regarding violation of basic human rights, they, they are looking for, in total case, uh, in Japan, of course, uh, the remedy is mainly the monetary compensation. But besides monetary compensation, we have to teach more. And what should we, what, what, what has been done to attain the real historical uh, reconciliation. The, we can't get the full compensation for the uh, tragedies, but we need the kind of the, uh, think about the core issues uh, of getting back to the normal relationship after the past uh, tragedy. And uh, so uh, reviewing a lot of concrete issues, for example, including um, comfort women issues or Nazi massacres, uh, there's a systemic serious issues. As I mentioned, uh, the young people, even though many of them have conscious, they do not know much about the details. That's the crucial point. And, uh, and that's due to the kind of uh, strategic education policy from the conservative side. And, uh, and as the theoretical framework of the process of getting reconciliation, the education should play a very important role. And the prime minister, for example, and the, the discussion in the Japanese diet uh, play a very symbolic role. In the mid the 2000s, the prime minister Abe said in the Japanese diet, there's no proof of forcibleness of forcibleness in recruiting uh, the comfort women. They, they join, there's no proof, there's no evidence. In spite of uh, 200 uh, comfort women who came forward to uh, to make to publicly uh, say about their miserable past. But according to the legal rules, we have to, we have to 
proceed based on the written evidence. But we have to rethink about uh, that issue, the, the principles. And uh, we have to, in, in this in this field, we, we have to include, in, include their, their oral testimonies uh, you know, they, all of them told us about the middle of, in spite of their discrimination or marginalization. And uh, so this is uh, a general issues and, uh, and uh, Abe uh, himself, uh, they, he tried to say, oh, they uh, joined prostitution voluntarily. It's very humiliating to comfort women themselves. Uh, and we have to think about that. And many young Japanese people uh, have not studied much about the, the past. And that's the, that's the starting point of the gap between two countries. And uh, if we know the, the historical past, if we take seriously the historical past humbly, you know, the, in spite of many concrete uh, differences of opinions, but systemically, uh, we need to reconsider the reconciliation process. As I said many times, the first stage is the recognition of the details of historical past from the perpetrator side by studying a lot uh, uh, the historical documents that we should do uh, in every historical past cases. Uh, and for example, I, I don't know much, but uh, uh, you experienced the dictatorship uh, in this country as well. And many uh, Brazilian citizens suffered a lot in those days. And there should be theoretically kind of a reparations issues, but uh, even in, regardless of litigation, the, we should know the historic past humbly. That's the starting point. That's the, that's the least thing I should want to say uh, in this lecture. And the situation might change in better way in every cases, you know. And uh, uh, regarding many concrete cases, I pay visit to neighboring countries and many, many times and, uh, and to, to attain kind of a friendly relationship. It's not the matter of money, monetary compensation. You know, the, the Japanese government always I noticed without recognizing uh, historical past in details, they just try to provide money, but it doesn't, that such way of uh, provision, uh, providing money uh, doesn't solve these issues. This is another crucial point I want to make uh, in this lecture. So, you know, the, but on the other hand, there are so many, so many Japanese citizens, including the uh, Japanese Brazilian citizen, like Professor Nino Mia, we have really uh, tried to think about the past uh, injustice and they, they tried to, that's why, that's why the Asian Women's Fund uh, uh, was held, it, uh, we have. But the, the way of uh, pro providing money is always without sincere apology. So what made apology become sincere, we have to study humbly what happened for them, what miserable past they, uh, they have. Uh, so I, I'm reiterating the same thing, but the, in, in spite of the, some, some uh, difference of opinions and uh, uh, this theoretical uh, framework might, uh, be be common, I, I think. Uh, 
Yeah, that's my limited yes. answer. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> as I said, <laughs> I recognize the existence of all these problems during the war. Right? And uh, yes, maybe Japanese government sincerely had to humbly make an apologize and so so. But uh, this government was elected by Japanese people. Unfortunately, even in the some small period of a socialist government in Japan, they didn't do anything about that. Huh? And uh, systematically, we have liberal democrat party in the power. Huh? Mr. Kishi, almost he was a war criminal. Huh? And uh, I don't know how to say this, but uh, each people elect his government. Uh, we have a very, uh, we, we have very strong problem in the Brazilian government now, but this was elected by Brazilian people. We are we're going to have an election in October, maybe some, something will be changed. <laughs> uh, in yeah. Japan, now in, in July, now, I think now, we are going to have a, an election for the part of a House of uh, Councillors. I don't know, but... Uh, in Japan, we, we don't, uh, frankly speaking, we don't experience, we haven't experienced the genuine democracy from the grassroots level. After the end of World War II, Douglas MacArthur came to Japan from, from top down, we experience uh, democracy, but, and without any a reparation uh, process in those days, there's a big, big difference between Germany and Japan. Yes, yes. And uh, they experience this process and they experience uh, kind of, uh, in that sense, the reparation, uh, many uh, uh, theorists say the reparation uh, should be the basis of democracy. Reparation should be the base of human rights values. So uh, in Japan, the, there's a, a conservative side still going uh, from during war and uh, uh, until nowadays. And in spite of the term of democracy, the present government has been uh, supported by the ultra right wing group and who themselves without any, uh, any sense of uh, uh, apology or the uh, self -ref reflection about the 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 past injustice they they're continuing and continues to uh, support the conservative government and uh, and then as I mentioned many times the young generations problem they non political many of them non political without knowing or without any interest in the historical past that's the very systemic problems and uh, and I. Uh, Okay. <laughs> okay, Professor, thank you very much. So, and, uh, so sorry, I, half past I 11. And uh, well, he I didn't have... finish yet. Yeah. So in Monday, in this same room, we are going to have another lecture, Professor. Okay. Maybe the audience with the same or not, I don't know. But uh, we can continue the discussion yeah. on next month. Yeah, if yes? you have some time to spare, please come back here again. And uh, next week and uh, please uh, show me your uh, reaction to my lecture. Show me your opinions uh, as uh, he did. And uh, uh, please, yeah, thank, thanks again for your attendance and thank, yeah. Okay, thank you very for, much. For your attention. Bom, então, a aula está terminada. Muito obrigado, professor Gustavo, pela sessão desta...
nessa sua aula e quer dizer alguma coisa? Não, né? Ok, muito obrigado.